Okay, so we're here with Daniel Morley of the Editorial Board of Socialist Appeal and regular contributor to Marxist.com. Uh, and we're talking today about uh, the Tiananmen Square movement, the 25th anniversary of which is this year. So Daniel, could you start off by explaining a little bit about the movement? Okay, so the movement began in uh, the middle of April uh, for 1989, um, and it was initiated by students, um, and uh, which in, in, in that day, 25 years ago, represented a much smaller proportion of the population than they do today. Um, and, uh, and a more really slightly more elite section of the population than today. Um, the movement basically started um, in response to um, the death of Hu Yaobang, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, who was a, had been a general secretary of the Communist Party and was seen as a liberal and was pushed out and then he died. And um, so initially started actually as a sort of mourning uh, for him. Um, but it quickly um, developed some demands. It was a very spontaneous movement, really. And uh, its demands mainly were basically of a democratic nature for um, reform of the Communist Party, for you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, those kinds of demands in general. Um, there were also demands relating to education, like better payment for sort of intellectual jobs, journalists, things like that which obviously reflects the background of those who were involved in the movement. Um, but it also very quickly became sort of a magnet, really, for all of the discontent in society, and therefore um, the working class began to um, uh, be attracted to the movement too, uh, So, or at least sections of the working class, particularly in Beijing, with the uh, formation within the movement itself, the formation of the Beijing Autonomous Workers' Federation, and, uh, and that sort of fraternised with the students, but there were some tensions there as well. But thanks to the, the formation of that organisation, some social demands were put into the movement as well, in particular for, for workers' control of, 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 of production. There was a lot of anti-corruption uh, demands as well. So the movement had a very, I mean, it only existed for two months, so obviously it didn't have a complete program, it wasn't perfectly consistent, but generally had a, a, a democratic, anti-bureaucratic, anti-corruption um, kind of uh, character, um, and it rapidly spread around the country from Beijing to about 400 cities, um, and uh, you know, initially met with some support even from sections of the regime, before the regime had really decided what to do about it. Um, and um, a, a number of events took place. Obviously, famously, the that image of the of the tank man, you know, standing in front of that line of tanks, and uh, that indicates the repression, which came later on the fourth of June, nineteen eighty nine, was the date really when they put an end to the movement. They decided to send in about three hundred thousand troops to crush the movement violently. Um, and that really just put an end to it, um, put an end to the movement itself, although obviously the consequences, you know, uh, there were reverberations from it, but that was the end of the movement. Okay, so can you give us a bit of the background of this movement? What were its causes? Well, basically twofold, really. Um, on the one hand, obviously, um, China had, ever since 1949, been a planned economy, um, but also a planned economy that was... Um, uh, Stalinist really in its leadership. Um, everyone I think is familiar more or less with um, the fact that it was under the leadership of Mao until 1976 and sort of modelled itself on the Soviet Union although with some differences. Um, so no freedom of speech and expression uh, for example and a sort of bureaucratic dictatorship over things. So there was always obviously discontent if you like uh, at the bureaucracy and the lack of um, democratic freedoms. Um, and that can, can be seen and expressed in the uh, movement, especially because of its sort of student or intellectual character. Um, democratic demands particularly were at the forefront. So it caused by that on the one hand. But what really brought it you know, to the forefront, what made it happen in 1989 rather than at any other time, were, were the um, economic reforms that had been taking place for just over 10 years then, started by Deng Xiaoping in 1978. Um, and these democratic, uh, sorry, these economic reforms um, were basically pro-capitalist reforms, 
um, which was still in their more or less early stages then in comparison with today, but had made some very important differences in Chinese society, but crucially hadn't removed the one major source of discontent really in China, which was the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy, the dictatorship remained, um, but you now had the introduction of, of incentives, you know, for, um, for workers and for, for managers. You had um, uh, a sort of dual pricing system, so the introduction basically of market prices for things. Uh, and you had an explosion of corruption and the black market that went along uh, with this. So, in my opinion, the real cause of the movement, the immediate cause obviously being Hu Yaobang's death, and his, well, his also his, his, his expulsion from power, but um, the real kind of spark of the movement was the inflation, the falling living standards, the increasing inequality, the sense of alienation that this obviously generates, and the sort of also just the general turbulence that you know any any time a repressive regime begins to change, um, you know begins to shake up society, then it's always a very dangerous time for that regime. And this was a period like that. It was a period of big economic changes, of growing class polarization. Um, of a lot of corruption, of falling living standards for many, not for everyone, but for sections of society. Um, and I suppose the sort of, sh the change in the, the sort of structures of society, the economic structures created uncertainty and also a questioning of, of sort of established norms, which I suppose gave rise to um, the, the movement itself. Um, but yes, it was a movement mainly for democratic reforms in defence of of Hu Yaobang and what they saw he stood for, um, uh, that was, really, you know, so there's an accumulation of, of these two main factors, the economic reforms and the bureaucracy and corruption. Okay, you mentioned earlier some of the reverberations that resulted from this movement. What were some of the consequences of the Tiananmen Square movement? Well, initially, for the first couple of years, not very much other than the repression of those involved. Um, uh, but when, you, when we step, take a step back and look at the bigger picture, we can see that the, the consequences were profound. And I would argue that actually what's interesting about it is it shows the way in which, um, on the contrary to the idea that capitalism brings democracy or needs democracy, is actually the very opposite, because the, the, the successful um, oppression, repression of the movement, the destruction of the movement violently, um, gave if you like, a political kind of breathing space for the, the existing apparatus, the existing regime, to expand their, um, the economic reforms, in other words, the introduction of capitalism. Um, the, the leader of the Communist Party at the time of the repression, and the, the one who really sort of led the repression, was Deng Xiaoping, who ironically is always kind of celebrated in the West as the great reformer. They never really mention that he was responsible, um, basically, for the repression of Tiananmen Square. So he was, he is famously the, the great pro-capitalist, if you like, in China's history, uh, the capitalist Rhoda, um, and, uh, and he led that repression. And in 1992, which is only three years later, once the sort of dust had settled, he famously began his southern tour, where he re went around key uh, areas on the co south coast of China, uh, key economic areas where um, economic reforms were going to be piloted basically and he sort of led that he really pushed for that and in my opinion it was the political breathing space they were afforded by the successful crushing of the movement that gave them the confidence to begin to move down that road and with that you had in the 1990s that was that was when really the capitalist reform really sped up the privatization of huge numbers of state-owned enterprises the taking away of the benefits that came with that for, for working class people, the, the sacking of, of tens of millions of, of, of working class people and the creation of a rust belt, in, in particularly in northern parts of China and northeastern parts of China. Um, you have, um, uh, yes, yeah, so very rapid economic reforms, uh, but no real democratic reforms to go with that. In fact, arguably even more a tightening up of the sort of a bolstering of the police force in the army. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, there were very profound consequences for the, the, the labour movement, which of course, as we know, was going to explode, or, or rather the working class was going to explode in scale, thanks to the, these economic reforms, thanks to the growth uh, 
of capitalism in China has created a huge working class. But the, that, the, the Beijing uh, Autonomous Feder uh, Workers' Federation that was created then and was destroyed also by the repression, um, but nevertheless that sort of symbolised, if you like, the, the rebirth of the Chinese working class, or, the, or, or rather the rebirth of their own independent organisations, if you like, which have um, slowly but surely since then, with the growth of the work, numerical growth of the working class, have gained little by little, especially recently. Um, so on the other hand, that, that, that experience, I believed, at least to some limited extent, ushered in um, uh, a sort of a period of, of growth of the working class and, and of the ind or help, rather than causing it, it was sort of like an omen, if you like, of the growing independent, political independence of the working class, which we're now really beginning to see bear fruit. Okay, so uh, here we are today, 25 years on from the Tiananmen Square movement. What kind of lessons can we draw from that movement for today? Yeah, well, the movement, I think much like um, the revolution in Egypt in the last few years, obviously was much more short-lived than that and didn't topple the regime. But similarly to that, it was the first movement um, for a long period of time, really. Uh, from the first sort of independent movement of the masses and as such was confused, um, disorganised, more or less leaderless, similarly with Egypt and, um, and in particular its class character was, it was led really by petty bourgeois elements, although as I said the working class began to play a role in it. It was led by petty bourgeois elements, students mainly. Um, and that really reflected the conditions of China at the time. Um, in other words, the working class was smaller then, um, and uh, interestingly also the, the crushing of the movement was enabled by the, yeah, probably partly by the fact it was mainly student-led, and obviously students are sort of politically weak, they can't really go organise a, a strike which is going to cripple the country, so that makes them very uh, sort of weak in the face of repression. But also the, the way in which they repressed the movement was through the army, of course. And the army at that time was composed basically of peasants. And the peasants in China then would have been very um, distant, if you like, from the sort of intellectual layers in the cities that they would have seen, and also from the working class. Um, and uh, it was, would have been much more pliable tool in the hands of, of the bureaucracy, basically, to get what they want. Today, however, um, is a very different situation. Although the problems that the, they were responding to in 1989 have only gotten worse. The, obviously the, the dictatorship is still there, but the level of corruption and inequality um, has only ex, you know, increased since then enormously. And we know that now China is one of the most unequal countries of the world. Corruption is a huge issue in China, bigger than it was then. And inflation and things like that are eating into people's living standards. So all of those problems are the same, if not worse. But on the other hand, and this is a, an enormously progressive thing from a Marxist point of view, the Chinese working class is absolutely huge now. It is the biggest working class in the world. Um, and, and very interestingly, is, is beginning to understand that, is beginning to flex its muscles, is, is beginning to sort of feel its own strength. Um, it, there are more strikes year after year. In the first three months of this year, in the first quarter of 2014, uh, the level of strike, strike activity was up 31%. From last year, and last year was already a record-breaking year for the number of strikes. The strikes are better organised, they're more confident, they're more militant, and interestingly, they're winning to a large extent. And the working class is beginning to form its own independent organisations. Um, it's in some areas, like in, in uh, Guangdong, it's being actually allowed to form its own trade unions uh, to a limited extent, obviously monitored by the state and everything. And other uh, workplaces like Foxconn are also allowing the workers to form a union, although again, obviously, that's an initiative from Foxconn itself, so they're trying to control that. But that indicates the, the objective change that is, is forcing, if you like, a, a change in the leadership of China, which the leadership, as repressive as it is, uh, feels it cannot stop the working class, and it might be better to allow them some freedoms to organise and express themselves, basically. Um, and that shows the tremendous strength of the Chinese working class. And as I said, it knows that strength. It's, it's conscious of its interests to a large extent. And, uh, and, and, and it's beginning to learn how to organise itself. And the students also, 
are much more sort of pulled into the trajectory of the working class. There are far more students today. Uh, I think there's something like 7 million students graduating every year in China now. It's about 10 times more than it was in 1989, something like that. And the students are, much like in countries like Britain, are proletarianized. Um, it, many of them, upon graduating, can only get jobs in, in factories like Foxconn, actually. Some of the Foxconn workers are actually graduate students. They find themselves having similar wages to what the students get, uh, sorry, to what the workers get, or even worse in some cases. Uh, and many of them can't find jobs. There's a, there's a growing crisis of sort of graduate unemployment, similar, again, very similar to Britain, of course. Now that China is a capitalist country, it will begin to have the same problems of, of capitalist countries. So um, those, the student population is much closer to the working class. There are signs of the Chinese students beginning to look to the working class to begin to try and help organize them, um, to hold Marxist sort of study circles independently of you know, the, the official ones provided by the state, that kind of thing. Um, and so clearly if there's going to be another Tiananmen Square movement, and I certainly believe there will be, there will be an explosion at some point uh, of revolutionary activity aimed at toppling the regime. And sure, it will probably be confused initially again, of course. There's no sort of prepared leadership in advance. There's no, uh, you know, there's, under a totalitarian regime, there's not much chance to practice, if you like, uh, political power. Um, so it will probably be, have, have a large element, large, will be largely confused in some ways. But on the other hand, um, I think that the, the class character of it will be overwhelmingly working class. It won't be petty bourgeois led in the main, um, and um, it will have a high degree of class consciousness um, in, involved in it, um, and very powerful working, enormously powerful working class. So the lessons for today, I suppose, uh, are, are going to be felt almost automatically, because the, the, the weakness of, of the movement then was its petty bourgeois character, if you like, its, its sort of student-y character. And today it will be led by a class which is the most, the largest and most powerful working class in the world, who 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 knows how to strike, and if it does strike, not affects not only the Chinese ruling class but also the whole of world production. So they have enormous power in their hands, and as I said, they are increasingly conscious of that. So um, the, the, uh, I think that in that respect, the lesson, if you like, will automatically be learnt. On the other hand, the the students, if they want to play a role in the movement. Um, uh, they have to use the, the abilities that they do have, in other words, the, the amount of free time, the ability to study, etc. They should use that to, to train themselves up in revolutionary and Marxist ideas and to go to the working class, to help them in their struggles, um, to organise Marxist study circles in the universities but also in workplaces. Um, and to begin to build up their own forces in preparation for such an event because I'm absolutely sure that that will take place. There is a seething discontent in Chinese society. There is a, an acute awareness of the inequality, of the corruption, of the injustice. And uh, one final thing as well that doesn't bode well for the regime is how will they stop this? Well, for a start, we've indicated the economic power that this class has, which wasn't really there before. But also you have the fact that the means of repression are not so strong as before. They've started to spend more on internal security than in defence, even though they're spending increasingly large amounts of, on defence as well, which is worrying their neighbours in, in the region. It's, nevertheless, they're spending more on internal security, and that tells you, uh, I think that's the first time in their history, and that tells you a lot. Um, and uh, that means they're, ve they're very worried about what's going on. Also, the statistics show that in the strikes of this year, um, there has been a police presence of some kind on 45% of the strikes of 2014, whereas it was only about 11% of in uh, police presence on the strikes of 2013. So that's an enormous difference. Clearly the regime is very conscious of what's going on and is very worried. But how do you stop such a movement taking place? As I said, in, in, in 1989, the army so they sent 300,000 troops in. Now, 300,000 troops is a huge number of troops. Those are not elite troops. Those are ordinary people. 
in, back then they had the advantage that uh, on the one hand they were from a peasant background and were rather alienated from the city. And secondly, obviously those involved in the movement were largely relatively privileged students, which also would have alienated the peasants. Today the movement is likely to be working class led and it will often be that the migrant workers or the children of migrant workers and the, the army is much closer to the working class simply because the working class has expanded so much and um, you have the fact obviously that many of the workers are probably you know, related to people who are in the army, related to peasants if you like. Um, so that if you want to use a force of that kind of scale of 300,000 or more that you would need to sort of crush a movement on the scale that we're going to see in China, uh, it's gonna, there's going to be a, an acute danger of fraternisation, in other words, of, of the rank and file of the army and the, and the police force, especially the army, being influenced by the movement and the sheer force and strength of the movement. Um, and therefore there's a big question mark over whether they could even use these means of repression to hold the movement back. So um, I would argue that China is long overdue another Tiananmen, if you like, another Tiananmen Square. Yeah, it's, it is coming. Some, something like that is going to come, a, a, a strike wave, a mass mobilisation across the country. And there's a big question mark over whether the regime can resist that. And we would uh, obviously support such a movement enormously and argue that in order to complete its task and really liberate the Chinese masses, they can't just fight for democratic reforms because the key problem in China today is the enormous inequality, the pollution, the exploitation, etc. They need to fight for socialist demands, to go back to socialism, although genuine socialism this time, socialism with workers' democracy in it. And, uh, and I believe that that actually is, is something that the working class will be looking towards anyway. Okay, Daniel, thank you very much.